Hello, can you hear me? I can start off. Start in three, two, one. And all the first thing I want to understand is what this plan looks like. Within this plan looks like a couple of things. The first is it's direct governmental expenditure being spent um, on certain industries like that determined to be important and they want to prop up. This is distinct from the direct stimulus bill was also being passed at the same time, in which money was directly given to Americans um, around the country in order to take them through the period of COVID. Critically, I think there are some things you want to know. One, that is mutually exclusive because the government was that the argued that funds are more important to be within the like, infrastructure rather than on stimulus. The implication of this was that given Republican backlash, the degree of stimulus was small and limited. It reached less people than Biden administration wanted it to, and it gave less money to each of these people. The second thing about this was that it had the explicit aim to bring supply chain back to America and to build alternative infrastructure to things that were rising elsewhere around the world. Key thing to note here was that given the American first nature of this model and the fact that spending in America and building in America is more expensive, what actually happened was that because the government chose to fund this either directly through their bureaucracy or through American firms specifically, the implication of this was that it cost significantly more than have to build the exact same infrastructure in a more open manner everywhere in the world with non-American firms chosen. That's, I think, the comparative. The alternative we stand for is a small stimulus that were more went to people directly and where stimulus was not built with the explicit aim of bringing supply chains locally and where companies were not told that they had to bring their supply chains back in order to get any degree of these benefits outside of the house. Any verificatory people I'll take them. No? Okay. Two arguments from us, therefore. First, so this hurts the global economic recovery and therefore is something we regret. Second, to the degree they talk about the US, why this is something that we Yes, Amri. So the Republicans didn't want to increase stimulus from 600, 600 to the 2000. In your world, what is that going to look like for the Republican Party? So the Republicans' concern is international debt. In a world where you reduce the debt because you don't spend on the stimulus, there is more money you can be able to spend on people. This is for economy. First, why do I, I think that this increase hurts global e economic recovery? The first thing I want to note is that this was this ultimately is, is a form of protectionism from the United States, different time, kind of tariff from like the right, whereas Trump used tariffs on goods coming in. What, what Biden used was trying was building up this economy at the expense of international economics and forcing people to bring supply chains back to America. The implication of this is several things. Even to the degree that I assert that this is an injection of money in the global economy, therefore beneficial in terms of the numbers, the question is where this money goes. Insofar as we recognize that this money primarily stays within the United States because supply chains move back to the United States, because funding goes to infrastructure projects within the United States, I think that means that even the increased spending on the United States majority of the league means that a significant degree of international injection benefited the international economy. The second the LDCs were hurt at a moment where they are the because the planes start to move back from places that they are gone to, like Vietnam, like Mexico, back into the United States. The implication of this, therefore, is that at points it decreases the ability for countries to negotiate with the US at an even playing position, at a significantly less even playing position, at a point that you don't even have things like supply chains that you are able to use to extract concessions from the US. The extent of hegemony that the US is therefore able to implement is significantly increased. On the comparative, we still get some degree of international of improvement through stimulus, but I think we get this with more internationalized supply chains and at a lower, at, at a rate that is therefore more equitable internationally. The second thing I want to talk about is inflation. What I want to understand is that this inflation happens exclusively on that side for a few reasons. One, because on comparative, we're likely to spend less in total, which means that the extent of inflation is a lot lesser. Two, also because I think on that side, on our side, individuals tend to save more at the point the money goes directly to them. And that decreases uncertainty. And that de because of the uncertainty that exists within the global economy, the fact that they've just come through a period of COVID, which means that they're therefore likely to spend less as per how, for example, fiscal stimulus has worked in Asia historically without as much inflation. There are a few implica implications of this. The first thing I want to note internationally is that this means that imports for the U from the US become incre incredibly more expensive at a point the US dollar is priced higher. Insofar as many economies around the world either rely on one, international trade and therefore like imports, or two, their supply chains are import dependent, i.e. like they take some things and then they sell them, they, they improve them and sell them elsewhere. Their value added supply chain 
um, economic model gets significantly harder to execute at a point that goods become significantly more expensive. But secondly, also, this means that in response to inflation, at a point that countries like, like organizations like the Fed choose to increase interest rates in order to try to rein this in, what that means is when global interest rates go up, that disproportionately hurts LDC economies that need to borrow cheaply now at a point when credit rating for them is lower, but at a point where they need to st stimulate their own economies, the ability to access credit becomes significantly harder in the status quo. Second, why do I think this hurts the United States? The first thing I want to know is that this leads to an increased amount of debt. I'm willing to accept that this is bipartisan, but three things still happen. The first is that I think this hurts the ability to justify future social spending within Biden's term. Insofar as Biden also wants to do things like social security reform, insofar as he also wants to do this, do things like, uh, like immigration reform, all of this require money that the Republicans are less likely to be willing to let go. I, they might say that this will happen anyway, but the difference is in terms of political imaging. At the point that the Republicans are able to say that Biden already added significantly to national debt, and when they are able to say that they were previously bipartisan, that gives them the political ability to limit the extent to which they are willing to consent into this future social spending, which in turn means that Biden's, the rest of Biden's agenda is likely to be significantly hurt by this particular decision. But the second thing to note is that this is also mutually exclusive from increased stimulus spending that one, I think, reaches the vulnerable better in the status quo because the problem on that side is that infrastructure the growth is likely to like, benefit disproportionately the people who control this infrastructure, i.e. the rich at the top of this corporation. But second, it's also more immediate in that people are able to have significantly more leeway to determine what they want to do with the immediate money that they're able to get from governments in greater stimulus bills. But third, I also think that this increment of debt means that it's significantly less politically tenable to vote in Democrats moving forward at a point that the national debt narrative becomes stronger in the minds of Republicans and the American public. Therefore, I think whether it's about America or the economy writ large, this is detrimental to those, and that's why we oppose. Hi, can I be heard? Yeah, I'll take the eyes in chat. Okay. Starting my speech in three, two, one. To be clear, these large-scale government policies probably looks like the remit of Biden's Build Back Better program, where he intends to do three things. First is to simply provide stimulus packages to the unemployed. I'll explain why that's part of the debate. Secondly, giving loans to corporations, and allowing them to get back on their feet. And thirdly, the reviving of industrial projects, such as the expansion of broadband coverage throughout Midwest America, bridges and highways between rural areas to urban centers to unlock untapped labor, energy subsidies for green alternatives, such as sustainable infrastructure, distribution of things like clean drinking water in places like Flint. So to be clear, the first thing I want to talk about is why this is not mutually exclusive stimulus. Because first, on face, this is part of the like, holistic set of large-scale government projects, given that the distribution of stimulus packages to people all around the America who are un un unemployed sounds awfully lot like a large-scale government project to me. Just because it's mutually exclusive to other parts within that set of large-scale government projects doesn't mean it's not one of them. Like Giving loans to corporations may very well be mutually exclusive to spending on infrastructure. That doesn't mean they're not both part within the thing that we want to do. Okay, having said that, opening up open government has two broad points. The first is that it hurts global economic recovery because this is a form of protectionism for the United States. And the second thing is that it's hard to do the rest of the things you want because you're spending a lot on this and this causes inflation. I'll deal with that in the material, but I just want to highlight that the first thing is that it's not necessarily clear whether or not these are worth the trade-off of the United States facing many exogenous harms, such as for careening further into climate change, has such as not being able to provide like food and water for the average citizen, and many of these places have been left behind by the economic response of the United States. It is simply not clear whether or not it is worth it, we will also impact explaining why even if they have the best form of their benefits, it is simply not worth it. Three things in this speech. First, will the plans succeed or pass in Congress? Since I know that this will definitely be challenged, like, oh, the Republicans will make it hard for you. The first is that it's easy for the Biden administration to justify this under significant risk because of the mass unemployment, the need to refinance unemployment packages, restore confidence in the economy, and broadly the impending risk of COVID, and the need to gird yourself against future pandemics, and that there simply aren't any alternatives to provide the large-scale health infrastructure and other infrastructure forms that this demands. I want to note that this has been done great before in America to great effect, like the Obama administration in response to financial crisis has implemented several 
fundamental policies in order to allay the crisis of the market. Trump did something similar when the stock market wasn't doing so well and spent trillions on it or billions on it uh, in order for it to recover. Secondly, the Republican Party it themselves have an incentive to buy into this plan and cooperate. Many of the states that they are in control of will particularly benefit from this project. That's why the Build Back Better plan intends to set up these broadband networks and energy plans heavily involving Midwestern states. Secondly, how do we expect Biden, Biden to finance the deal? This will notably respond to the point on inflation. The first is that we expect this to happen through the Federal Reserve, the sale of debt and allowance of other countries to buy back their debt so that they are no longer indebted to the US and continue trading with them. So this deals with the inflationary risk because we identify that the inflation is temporary. Financing projects will motivate the economy in a variety of ways, causing people and private corporations to spend more, which causes inflation to go back down in the future. We're willing to take the short-term power of inflation if it means that people aren't starving. More importantly, though, we also identified that there are two other ways for this field to be financed, aside from the pressing Cong aside from pressing Congress to increase the budget limit, we also expand, uh, ex expect a revised tax plan to distribute the tax burden more evenly through large corporations as well as redirecting stimulus away from them to free up the budget. Okay, having said that, arguments. Number one, we suspect the benefit of the stimulus and projects first and foremost is to institute quicker recovery in the United States from coronavirus. There are six ways this happens. The first is that people get directly employed by these projects in hundreds of thousands of different union jobs, whether it be uh, construction workers being able to work on these things, whether it be scientists employed to work under in organizing these projects and so on. We think the simple scale of this, pulling people out of poverty, pulling people into positions where they can regain social mobility and contribute, them, uh, contribute to the economy is simply gigantic in the sense that this is a multi-trillion dollar project. Secondly, is that the stimulus allows the economy to recover by helping people meet basic needs first, which allows them to do things like become more productive in the future and eventually send their, send their kids to school by developing themselves. Thirdly, the stimulus allows corporations to recover and expand operations, hiring people again because of the fact that it gives them loans in order to be able to start up operations again. Fourthly, the stimulus allows corporations to make capital intensive purchases for things like factories to cheapen the production of goods and sell products cheaper to more people. Fifthly, the products themselves have serious infrastructure benefits. We're talking about communication and travel between areas to reduce the cost of trade and reduce substantial amounts of inefficiencies. We're talking about billions of dollars saved from traffic no longer being such a problem in the Midwest. We're talking about things like health, the healthcare system allowing people to benefit from greater work security and allowing like even smaller areas and smaller states to, to be able to, to, to retrench COVID lockdown policies to ensure that the economy is lubricated and it's more, more sufficiently providing for the needs of people. But also these are just substantial quality of life improvements, like allowing people to have access to clean water is simply something that in and of itself is a moral good. Note that this is the most efficient comparative to any other solution, first because it's bought in bulk and done in bulk, which means it allows us to coordinate the most efficient government response nationwide. But secondly, it's because we have the best possible price as corporations nationwide bid for contracts to compete with the government. Framing of these benefits. Number one, these are trivially some of the most important benefits, since while many of the harms that people abroad are uncertain in that they can be substituted by the presence of another country, and that China will probably leap at the opportunity to take in the gap that the United States fills in, note that the holistic quality of life benefits are certain and guaranteed for the exogenous problems that would not be otherwise solved without the intervention of the government on opposition bench. That is to say, traffic that ends up costing the economy billions in inefficiency and car crashes, a healthcare system crumbling under the burden of a nationwide pandemic that leaves thousands of workers unable to heal and extended recovery for COVID. We're talking about an environment and an economy careening to collapse because of the fact that we have relied so much on coal that is coal that is clearly dirty and not clean and that definitely definitely devastates the lives of many people in rural areas as they are no longer to live and breathe clean air. Notably, though, the world also benefits from the rest of this. First of all, because trivially, the rest of the world gets better, cheaper goods and products from the benefits that we provide in opening opposition as the United States economy, uh, as the United States corporations recover. But secondly, is that this policy is not immediately protectionist. I want to note that you allow U.S. corporations to recover so that they can continue to trade and spend on economic deals with other countries. The reason why they pulled back supply chains in the first place was because it was more expensive due to the pandemic, which we fixed by making it less expensive. I'll take a few from CG. Go. How do you think corporations and businesses will respond from the inevitable rise in corporate tax? Well, we expect them to very, very enjoy, first, the massive increase in opportunities to the funding that we suggest. But secondly, is that even if some corporations leave, we expect a massive amount to come back in for the reason that we are, again, giving corp loans to corporations to survive. We are substantially increasing the amount of competition within the market by providing them more projects and more opportunities in order to participate. The scale and simply benefit of this is much larger, even than any possible capital flight argument you might bring up. But thirdly and lastly, is that like it's not necessarily clear whether or not a lower stimulus package on government 
will mean that the U.S. will itself be globalized. Like, first of all, it's entirely possible that many corporations still die out and are still unable to trade and spend on economic deals with other countries because they lack the continued presence and survival that you would otherwise be able to give them. But secondly, the matter of fact is that you need a stable infrastructure in order to support local economies to be local economies and local industries to be able to trade abroad and do the things that you want. So it's simply put that the alternative Gov provides is not sufficient in order to keep up with the international trade that demands them in order to give jobs and food and water and services to people in other countries, never mind the sheer cheaper goods and benefits that we give them on opposition bed. At the end of this speech, we do three things. First, we save the world, which is a pretty big benefit. Secondly, we explain why people in America substantially benefit and why they're most, most proximate to this harm. And thirdly, why people everywhere else in the world re receive massive benefits from this policy. Negate. All right, um, starting my speech in three, two, one. Care about providing for the average American. They must also care about providing for the average vulnerable American in the long term in a sustainable fashion. The problem with this particular policy is that they cannot just pick and choose what part of the Biden administration's plan that they are willing to support and just say that it's therefore good because these things are part of it. I think that the point here is what is inherent to what they have to defend is one, the scale of debt that will be taken on by the Biden administration in terms of forwarding this plan in its entirety. And secondly, the priority of where exactly that debt is going to go in terms of affecting the, the way that the American economy is going to recover. So those are the things that we want to zero in on in order to defend this case. I think a few things that we need to know. The first thing is a large amount of this debt is not just about building roads, building rivers, and giving out direct stimulus packages. I think that giving out direct stimulus packages is in fact a good alternative in the sense that it enables individuals to spend more money and in that way revitalize the economy from a ground up perspective. The issue here, however, is that you want to use a government directed approach in by taking on significant amounts of debt to try and create infrastructural projects in areas in which you are uncertain whether or not there is sufficient demand and in areas in which you're uncertain whether or not the payoff is going to be economically productive for your country. Secondly, I think a big part of this plan as well involves the reconstitution of supply chains within the US where it's mm -hmm. oftentimes and in the long run after the pandemic, for example, going to be significantly both more expensive and also less productive and, in and efficient. One of the strong reasons as to why this is true is because a large part of the reason why they were able to gain Republican support, I like the wishy-washy reason that the uh, opposition was giving you, is actually because they're incredibly fierce of China's manufacturing uh, growth and therefore as a result are doing this as a preemptive measure to try and ensure that manufacturing does not reply, rely on China any longer. But the point here is the reason we oppose this is because there's no actual benefit to doing this beyond some sort of egoistic benefit on America's part to preempt their loss of like complete global hegemony over the economy. Let's talk about what this does politically. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I want to note is I think that this policy is likely to fail for a number of reasons. The first reason obviously being that this is a massive gamble in the sense that you're taking on a significant amount of debt, which oftentimes leads on to knock-on effects that I think destabilizes the capacity for you to recover in the future. The first thing to note is, I think that what happens now is that you have to sell, as they argue, a lot more bonds. And I think the issue here is, this requires interest rates to increase and also increase the amount of uncertainty in terms of investment within your country. This therefore suggests that the US is going to spend more money in the future to try and buy back bonds in order to ensure that inflation is reduced. And at a point at which they are not able to do it, then life becomes significantly worse for both the average American but also the most vulnerable countries around the world as a result of the fact that the USD is now uh, becoming uh, greater in, in, in number and size. But secondly, I think that to the extent to which you want to make a government-directed approach in terms of trying to solve these problems, the issue here is one of the reasons why the US system is in such shittery is because their government, especially at the federal level, has never been able to accurately identify the areas in which these kinds of projects are best able to be developed. But particularly so, if you want to take the OO's benefits in its greatest extent, the reason why many of these infrastructural projects were not built in the first place is because you're talking about rural areas that are politically significantly less uh that, that are politically less um viable and, and one of the reasons why is because they're economically less productive as well this is obviously not to say that we should not help them but i think that the problem here is that when you're directed approach in terms of the scale and priority of the debt is primarily to these areas as opposed to over a long-term sustainable approach you are less likely to yield the kind of economic gains that their side is so reliant on the issue here however is that in the absence of you being able to demonstrate massive successes here is what is likely to happen the first thing is 
it is untrue that this debt will entirely be financed by bonds because you just cannot do that without like like severely affecting your own monetary fiscal, fiscal and monetary controls in your country. So a lot of these will also be funded by things, and this is what Biden has in fact proposed: a massive corporate tax hike, as well as the removal of rules, for example, like they allow companies to like not declare taxes on a certain of, of amount of their profit when they go offshore. The issue with this, however, is that I think that this also entrenches not just Republican support in terms of the increased polarization when the Republican batch recognizes that massive debt has not actually led to the outcomes that the Democrats have promised that it would, but also massive corporate lobbying in terms of funding more Republicans in order to ensure that such fiscal plans will never come to being ever again in the future. I think the issue here then is that as much as all wants to claim all of these benefits, you will need continual spending to do things like maintain these kinds of infrastructural projects, to ensure that the infrastructural project sees its end, and to ensure that there's greater there's greater spending and greater stimulus that can be given to these individuals in the future. At the point at which Democrats have their economic plans completely destroyed, I think that there's no capacity for you to be able to entrench these out outcomes later on in the future as well. Therefore, on their side, this is a massive risk that I think is insufficient and unnecessary for the Biden administration to take. The comparative that we argue is significantly better is actually one in which we thought that uh, the, the comparative that we argue was better was a slow increase in the amount of stimulus, maybe a slow and sustainable investment in the creation of the kind of projects that they talked about. If these are economically useful, then I think there is a massive benefit towards ensuring that these people are able to, uh, the, that these people are able, uh, I think there's a massive benefit ensuring that these things are done in a sustainable fashion, um, but also that it's done over the long period to ensure that the best decisions are made at every single point of these infrastructural projects being built. The second thing then I want to talk about is what exactly the comparative is. Before that, I'll take one from CEO. So you are against taking debt, you are against tax hikes, you say you want to do it over the long term, which Republican is going to support immigration, social reform and stimulus six times in your model to get it passed in the way that you say you need to? Okay, so I think that this particular POI is just a simplified straw man of what exactly you're talking about, right? Like, on their side, they seem to equate the idea that massive debt and, um, and massive tax hikes is equivalent to doing it over a long period of time when you're able to demonstrate at each stage some measure of success and some measure of returns of what exactly you're able to generate uh, on, that, on that point, right? I think that at this point, the problem with this is that when you, in, when you inject a significant amount of money into your economy, not just is this going to be seen as a landmark case, but also so you run significantly greater risk of your economy overheating for the reasons of inflation and the like that we told you about as well. I think that's the biggest harm on that side. The next thing then I want to talk about is what we, uh, that why the comparative was uh, why the comparative is better. The first thing is I think that to the extent to which you might hear Republicans on your side right now is largely because they are afraid of China. But but I think that this is a bad idea because that suggests that the reasons behind why they want to create these projects means that the KPIs they are looking at are not actually the ones that help the economy at all. For example, I think they are not going to be concerned with making a affordable manufacturing for individuals as opposed to trying to get supply chains in-house as quickly as possible. This creates problems of things like, for example, asset bubbles at a point at which there is an inflation and increase of hot money in terms of government funding into many, mess, uh, into many corporations and allows for individuals to uh, expand or generate projects at a point at which it's not actually sustainable or profitable for them to be able to do so. I think this is problematic in the sense that it, it is likely to create as well a standoff against things like China when it comes to antagonistic trade relations when it, when it becomes obvious that the US is trying to re-dominate the manufacturing sector. And I think that's significantly worse for the world as a whole as well, as opposed to a long-standing sort of shift in terms of like an e equilibrium when it comes to their capacity to have uh, control and power over their manufacturing. Um, and for these reasons, we are uh, proposed. I'd like to thank the previous speaker for their fine speech. Can I quickly check my panel is also ready? If you have any POIs, you can read in the chat. I'll watch the chat for all of your POIs. Okay, watching the chat. Yeah, got you. Starting my speech in three, two, one, and go. Pete Buttigieg is my hero. Um, empires rise and fall, but nothing is stronger than the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, and family. I'm going to talk about three things in this speech. Number one, 
why this is good for the developing world and why we beat out most of the arguments at Gov. Second, on why government has to defend a protracted and intermittent government stimulus, which is worse in the long run. And number three, on responses to DPM more. Firstly, on why this is good for the developing world. So Sean makes the argument that uh, you know we want to have more sustainable supply chains. We need to invest in debt very incrementally and have lower thresholds of stimulus over and over and then. And whenever there's a need for it, we will pay for it in that instance. I have three responses as to why this is significantly worse than their model. Number one, more U.S. dollars will circulate not just within the U.S. economy, but with its regional partners in our world. That's why it is good for us to spend billions and trillions of dollars now because the Fed was able to mitigate the risk of dollar shortages in developing economies across the world because it was selling debt and it was selling bonds while increasing capital outflows for the U.S. to be able to offer these states and reinvestment was possible for multinational corporations in many of the world because you were at a risk of losing your job in the developing world because they were not paying you to buy your goods from them so that you could create more in the manufacturing sectors in other economies and it was more easier for them to opt in because they had more dollars to save for themselves the economies could be able to be more sustainable and having more US dollars in this economy is more likely that they're less risky for collapse because the US economy and the US dollar most of these currencies are pegged to the US dollar and that's why they're reliant on the US dollar number two a faster recovered US will make it easier for the US to reinvest in its global partnerships which is brought out by billions and billions of dollars an example of the ability for pharmaceutical companies to now not only fund vaccine dosages in the U.S., but also expanded through COVAX and also through the investing through the U.S. and through stimulus packages in other economies as well, which is why there's a mutual incentive for other economies to buy into this deal where the U.S. does take a lot of debt, it does tax a lot of corporations so that it can recover and help other economies. But number three, because of capital appreciation, and this is the risk, right? The S&P recovered extremely fast with technological companies at the forefront and also multinational companies along with other pharmaceutical companies, which made it easier for those corporations to also expand in other economies and make it easier for them to hire other lower wage workers in those places. So we don't need to talk about the equity risk here because the equity risk is mitigated by the Federal Reserve reinvesting it in and of itself and the, and, and the risk of them uh, and, and the risk also being downtrodden by the ability to uh, you know uh, finance this through more and more stimulus packages which we said from David's speech is agreed upon bipartisanly. Secondly, why the government then has to defend protracted and intermittent government stimulus and their model. There are the following reasons as to why opening government is subject to a lower stimulus package, which is much more substantially worse. You will need to fund this over and over and over again, and it will be far too late when you fund it at the end. I'm talking about four things. Number one, the health risk. Number two, the employment risk. Number three, the trade shock risk. Number four, the commodity and debt risk. Number firstly, on the health risk. The health risk is much larger in their world because it's harder for industrial states to open up and mid Western states to open up simultaneously if other countries and other states within the United States are more at risk of spreading COVID to other economies as well. Because they can't do that through government shutdowns because they want to reopen the economy substantially. You can only resolve this if you have simultaneous packages that are given to many states so that they're able to, as much as possible, mitigate that risk through infrastructure projects and the hiring of different individuals within their localized economies, but also transporting these goods to different economies at the same time because the health risk is much lower. Number two, the employment risk is mitigated on our side because metropolitan centers are connected to urban centers through the broadback technology, the highways that we create, and through the business uncertainty that's mitigated because in their model, it they cannot happen at a simultaneous rate. That's why the monopolistic risk actually increases in their model because only large corporations that were already dominant now are the ones that are going to recover the fastest because they don't need to get bailouts from the government. Your side needs to have more bailouts from the government because more economies and more states, more of these corporations are more likely to fail because they don't have the frictional risk of frictional unemployment or the inability to invest in, infra in the insurance or uh, job loss insurance that you have to give for many of your for many of these uh, employees. Third, the trade shock risk is also increasing their model because China, as DPM points out, is the fastest to recover right now, which means that more of these economies will buy into the OBOR initiative, which obviously is bad for many reasons because of the debt trap diplomacy, the inability for them to reinvest in their own economies, and the fact that it's not a democracy. But at least with the US economy being able to reinvest uh, substantially faster and recover faster in our world, it's much easier for them to re revisit the regional trading agreements like the ASEAN or the CPTPP on our side. But lastly, the commodity and debt risk is also mitigated in our model 
because the non-financial corporate debt increasing significantly on their model leads to the inability for them to invest in real economic productivity, which essentially just means investing in their own jobs or ability to guarantee that I can pay you the next wage in the next three or four months because the uncertainty of the economy or another stimulus package happening in the future is also unlikely because of many government shutdown risks that might happen internally within the government. For these reasons, you have to invest in these in the long term. It is harder for you to sustain this. The long term risk is worse on their side. And even in like the climate change angle, like you have to increase in green technology in the high threshold payment now with millions and millions of dollars on our side. We mitigate that in the, because of the inability for them to do that with uh, lower thresholds of millions of dollars. Closing gov, let's go. Countries like Brazil or Argentina that have large US We don't think Republicans are going to get in power by that time because it is significantly likely that the Republicans will want to buy in for a fast economic recovery now. But if those other countries want to buy in too, we gave you many reasons as to why like the risk of dollar shortage is also mitigated. The economy collapsing is also mitigated on their side, and it's much easier for us to be able to say that in our side. DPM says that you can't fund this with debt and corporate tax because you know corporate tax is bad for companies. We give you two reasons as to why we win this. Number one, the EU did this already through the whatever it takes angle of Mario Draghi after the 2008 financial crisis. It was able to justify this with mutual agreements between different countries that bought into sharing that debt between themselves because there are mutual incentives for the U.S. to also participate in these deals because they can take that debt together and offshore that debt for each other. But number two, you can leverage this against the future because it's the most important thing that the economy of the U.S. will sustain itself rather than uncertainty being prolonged in their model. Companies buy into this now because they face the uncertainty of also having their economy collapsing as well. That's why they don't want to have another bailout. That's why they don't want to hire and retrain these workers over and over again. DPM says there's an asset bubble. Number one, the eviction asset bubble is the housing market crisis that is already existent now. You worsen that in your model with less and less stimulus packages that you give to citizens. But number two, we also sustain that in our model because it is improved because people can pay back those debts now because of the stimulus package that the government gives them. We need this with simultaneous infrastructure investment that happens through many different corporations through all ways because Pete Buttigieg believes in this. And we got this through broadband. We got this through bridges. We got this through the infrastructure projects that the government and Biden will only give. For these reasons, I am very proud to oppose. I'd like to thank the previous speaker for that. me. Right. Um. Two points in this speech. One, why the very mechanisms that OO push are things which are harmful to the healthiest parts of the economy and actually